Greetings from uh, Carabo and Kensi in uh, Rustenburg. Uh, they send their greetings. Uh, Kensi is uh, very pregnant uh, and uh, having back pains and so forth, so keep them in your prayers uh, as well in this final three or four weeks uh, before she delivers. I want us to look uh, this evening to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, verses 3 through 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. The scripture says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comforts. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. We were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer, so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. It was a Wednesday afternoon when we got the news. The doctor said that my wife, that Deborah, had cancer. We were shocked. We walked out in the passageway and we just embraced each other very tightly And she looked up into my eyes and she said, this is for the glory of God. We went home and we told the kids, we made a couple of rules in the house. We said, number one, we're going to use the word cancer. We're not going to use some other name. We're not going to talk about mom's condition. Let's face it. Let's look it in the eyes and call it what it is. Secondly, if you need to cry, cry. No explanations needed. Paul was afflicted. He says in verses 8 and 9, his afflictions were beyond his strength. God gave him more than he could bear. Beyond his strength to handle it. Despairing of life itself, feeling that he would die. You ever felt that way? I am going to die. Death is a real possibility. For Paul, it wasn't cancer. For Paul, it was conflicts in the church, conflicts against him, against the gospel, persecution. I love the way Paul speaks of this in verses 3 and 4 that that our afflictions enable us to help others in any of their afflictions. Sometimes we get the mistaken idea that unless I have experienced exactly what you are experiencing, we can be of no help to each other. Paul says all our afflictions, in any affliction, this applies And as he addresses this with the Corinthians, these afflictions and 
how, not so much how to handle them, though it's implied, but more of how to understand them. Isn't that the question we ask? Why? And as he talks about this, this passage is full of purpose. This is so that, this is so that, this was in order that. All through the passage, there's purpose here. Purpose to our afflictions. And there are three of them that Paul gives us through these Corinthians in the passage. The first is that our afflictions, my wife's cancer, you fill in the blank for your affliction, these afflictions are to equip us, to equip us to minister God's comfort to others. He begins like Job did when he suffered his affliction. Blessed be God. He is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort. And that comfort that he gives to us is so that, here's the purpose, that we can comfort others in any affliction. As we, in our affliction, learn to draw upon the mercies and the comfort of our Father in heaven, that is not only giving us comfort giving us mercy, a sense of relief from the sense of affliction. But it is also equipping us that we might minister to others who are in any affliction. It's a powerful reality to know the Father as the one who gives comfort, as the one who gives mercy. And to share that with others, equipping us, pass on the comfort, draw upon his mercy and comfort and pass it on to others. How? By pointing them to what you have discovered. By pointing one another to what you have learned of the mercies of your Father in heaven. Passing on the comfort you have received from him. You see, our afflictions are for the purpose of increasing our sympathy with others. Increasing our compassion upon others. Increasing our humility in submitting, moving us beyond cliches. Spurgeon tells a story of a time he was going into the pulpit to preach and he was so depressed, he was in such despair, he thought he was preaching in chains and he could barely get up into the pulpit to speak. And that day as he preached, he turned a man in the congregation away from committing suicide. The man sought him out after the sermon and said, you preached as a man who saw into the very condition of my soul. And I knew you could help me. He led the man to Christ and turned him away from committing suicide that very day. But Spurgeon makes the point that he never could have preached the way he preached unless he himself was in that condition of soul. The condition you are in, the afflictions you are suffering, are exactly the way and the, and the source from which God intends to use you. And you could never be used in the way he intends to use you unless you were in that condition, unless you were under that affliction. That should begin to radically change how we view our afflictions and to make good use of them for the benefit of drawing upon comfort and mercy to pass on to others. Your afflictions are part of the equipping that God is doing in your life to make you useful 
in ways you could not otherwise be useful to one another. The second purpose, he goes on to explain why it is this way. Why can't God equip us some other way? You'll notice in verse 5 he says, For, giving reason for another purpose. Verse 5 down to 7, For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. He calls these afflictions a sharing in Christ's sufferings. What does that mean? It means this. Jesus came and Jesus suffered. And in his suffering, he has redeemed us. But he has redeemed us in totality. He has redeemed our souls. He has redeemed our bodies, which will be resurrected one day. But he has also redeemed our sufferings. He walked in our skin on this earth. And he died as a man on that cross. And he took upon himself all the affliction, all the suffering that anybody could ever experience in this world. Jesus didn't have cancer, but Jesus experienced the sense of affliction that comes to someone who has cancer. Uh, That's good news for the ladies, right? Because Jesus never experienced childbirth, for example. So how can he be a sympathetic high priest to the ladies? Well, you see, he doesn't have to experience everything, but what he took on was the sense of affliction and sorrow and pain of everything we experience on our behalf. And so when we are suffering affliction now, it is not about God's judgment. He's the Father of mercy and comfort. What it is, is it is Jesus... Entering into a deeper experience of relationship with his child, with his bride. It is Jesus giving you a taste of the cup he fully drank down. And it's Jesus inviting you to take a sip of that cup with him. It's Jesus reaching into your life and saying, come share with me a taste of what I suffered for you. You know that people who go through great suffering, great trial, great trauma together have a bond that is unbreakable. Men who have fought in war together in the trenches come back and there is a bond there that is powerful and that is unbreakable. And Jesus enters into a deeper bonding with us by sharing some of his sufferings with us. Our sufferings are no longer about just being in a sin-cursed world. Our sufferings are now about sharing with Jesus, fellowship with Jesus, a deeper bond of communion with Jesus. That's what it's about. And that's what we're sharing with one another. We share in Christ's suffering and we share together the sufferings of Christ, verses 6 and 7. If we're afflicted, It's for your comfort and salvation. If we're comforted, it's for your comfort. You experience this when you also suffer these same things patiently. What do you mean suffer the same things, Paul? We don't all suffer the same things. Ah, but we do. Because every one of your sufferings is fellowship with Christ, and every one of my sufferings is fellowship with Christ. And so in whatever sufferings, it all 
has the common factor of suffering together with Christ. The afflictions are not meaningless. Jesus' sufferings were unique. They were redemptive. But in those redemptive sufferings, paying for sin, he redeemed our sufferings to become a fellowship with him. Can you see your sufferings in that way? Can you begin to understand and look at and can I go so far as to say learn to embrace your sufferings, your afflictions, as drawing you closer to Christ, as bonding you deeper? That's what it's about. It's the gospel. It's living, not just speaking, but living the gospel. It causes us to appreciate what Christ did so much more, doesn't it? If I can realize my affliction, my pain, is Him sharing with me. It's a taste of what He suffered that helps me appreciate so much more deeply what He suffered because He suffered infinitely more than I do. And some have suffered deeply, have suffered severely, and Jesus suffered even more. It gives credibility to the gospel. We're not people in fancy suits, driving fancy cars, living high on the hog, saying, oh yeah, Jesus died for us. We're down there in the dirt, in the sweat, the blood, and the tears saying this is the Savior we serve. This is a powerful reality. It means our sufferings are a stewardship. It means your afflictions a stewardship to share. To share in Christ, to draw upon the Father's comfort and mercy as Jesus himself did and share that among one another as a powerful testimony of that gospel. Suffering is for, your afflictions are for equipping you to minister God's comfort to others. It is for engaging us in the sufferings of Christ. Thirdly, it is for encouraging or empowering our confidence in God. Empowering our confidence in God. Verses 8 to 11, Paul says, It was beyond our strength, utterly burdened, despairing of life, receiving the sentence of death. It couldn't get any worse, Paul felt. Why? The middle of verse 9 But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. You see, if you're there under the heavy burden of affliction, you can't rely upon yourself. You need someone stronger. You need someone wiser. You need someone greater. And that's God because He raises the dead. Paul says we felt the sentence of death, but God raises the dead. Why did we feel we were going to die? So that we'd trust the one who raises the dead. Trust God. How does does he he do this? Verses 10, uh, verse 10, you notice he repeats this idea of delivered. Do you notice it? He delivered us. In the past, from a deadly peril that he's talking about, he will deliver us in what we're going through. And we've set our hope on him to deliver us again in the future. You've got to love the fact that Paul says there's purpose to our afflictions. It's equipping us to minister to one another. It is engaging us in fellowship with Christ So then how do we pray? Well, you pray for deliverance from the suffering, of course. 
<laughs> Paul doesn't become a passive fatalist and say, well, there's good purpose for the suffering, so let's grit our teeth and bear it. And Yes, there is that purpose, but don't let that stop you from crying out to God, deliver me from this. God delivers in, a, in different ways according to his sovereign purpose, right? We had to wrestle with this when Deborah had cancer. We had to say, how do we pray about this? How do we pray? And we finally came to the conclusion, here's how we pray. God, heal her. Heal her. Now, God could heal her, deliver her instantaneously, miraculously. Be wonderful. Anytime he does that. He could use, he could heal her, deliver her, you know, through the normal use of the means of medicine and treatment. But I guarantee you this, no matter what your affliction, you will be delivered from it. You will be healed from it. You will find relief from it in the resurrection. He is the God who raises the dead. So we prayed, God, heal her. We're not going to tell you how. Because we don't know what your wisdom knows about what you're doing and using in all of this. But heal her. Deliver me from this affliction. Paul prays it as boldly and as powerfully as possible, knowing that there's good reason for the affliction. Still pray, deliver We should have greater confidence in God because we know he can and he will one way or the other at one time or the next. How do we show that confidence in God? Well, it's what Paul's been doing and he tells others in verse 11, you help us by prayer also. Prayer, it's through prayer. It causes people to pray. We found that with Deborah's cancer, it caused people to start getting together and praying for her. Uh, there are churches all over uh, the world who, ha- who were praying for her. It moves people to pray, express our confidence in God by praying, and God answers those prayers. And when he does that, when we share in that in prayer, we go right back to verse 3. Because the end of verse 11 says that when the blessing is granted through the prayers of many, many will give thanks to God. Blessed be God. Two people in a church that I pastored were selling their homes. One of them shared it with the church and everybody was praying. The other didn't share it and kept it to themselves Eventually, both of their homes sold. The one who had shared it with the whole congregation, we rejoiced together when they said, our home sold. Oh, praise God. Everyone was happy and joyful. The other family, another week, comes and says, hey, we've been selling our home, and uh, it sold. And everyone said, oh, good. Many were not giving thanks because many had not invested themselves in prayer about it. God has very important purpose for your afflictions. Can you begin to see them this way and use them in this way, equipping you to minister his comfort to others, engaging you in fellowship with Christ in his sufferings, and empowering confidence in God. God chose to heal Deborah through the normal means of treatment, surgery, and so forth. We had opportunity to speak to others, other pastors, whose family had cancer, and encourage them. Use what you've been given. Not just gifts, talents, money, Use your afflictions. Out of that, enjoy fellowship with Christ 
and minister to others, sharing together in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you because we could never think of our afflictions in this way unless you had shown us in your word. Father, I pray that you would give freedom from those who are under the heavy burden of afflictions and can see nothing but darkness, despair, the sentence of death. Help us to see and to share in what these afflictions are for, for your glory and the furtherance of your gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.